Welcome to Meals for Maturity, Bible talks to help you mature as a follower of Jesus, by Pastor Dom Fiocco. I'm really enjoying and benefiting from these Meals for Maturity talks on numbers, uh, even though I have no idea really how many people are listening to this podcast, unlike at my church, for example, where I can actually see people and notice that when they're falling asleep. I can't quite see that over Spotify or Apple or YouTube, though if you're driving or riding your horse while you're listening, I really hope you are not falling asleep. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, I hope you're also finding these Bible talks helpful for pressing on in your journey with Jesus, you know, finding a short moment to hear more of God's Word. Well, we all love great storytellers, whether that's in books or movies, don't we? Great storytellers like Charles Dickens, Tolkien, J.K. Rowling, Roald Dahl, John Grisham, Beatrix, po- Beatrix Potter. The list goes on. You can insert your, your favourite in there. We all love a great story with twists and turns and a gripping tale. Even stories about gripping a dragon's tail, perhaps. We love books that are unput downable, especially on holidays or a long flight or if you spend a long time on the toilet, for example. God knows we love stories. And in the fourth book of the Bible, he's left us with some great true stories. Someone has written, Of all the biblical genres of literature, narrative may be described as a central, foundational and all-encompassing genre of the Bible. Narrative is the Bible's central message that God acts in history. No other genre can express that message as well as narrative. And what we have in today's episode is another great story, pointing us to God's greatest act in history. Across the many Bible stories that there are, they're there to teach us and to train and rebuke and encourage and ultimately point us to a greater trust in the greatest narrative of all time, featuring the greatest character ever to walk the earth. Well, for ancient Israel in their story, Uh, They've been singing the long and winding road for about 40 years. And it has been a long, winding journey, but they're nearing the end. Last time in Numbers chapter 20, we enter the 40th and final year of their wilderness wanderings. The very sad chapter, remember, with the death of Moses, uh, the death of, sorry, the death of Miriam, Aaron, more grumbling, uh, Moses' tragic failure to trust and obey God's word, and the news that he will not finish the journey or enter the land of Canaan. Chapter 20, verses 22 to 29, Aaron's son Eleazar becomes a high priest and the nation spends 30 days in mourning for the death of Aaron. And now in chapter 21 of Numbers, we reach a major milestone in the narrative across the wilderness with this new generation, which includes only Joshua and Caleb from the early days across Numbers. And the opening few verses of Numbers 21 has Israel achieving their great first victory as they move toward the land that God's promised them way back to their great, great granddaddy Abraham. In fact, by the end of chapter 21, there'll be three successful battles against Arad, uh, Sihon and Og, which I think has to be one of the best names in the Old Testament. Maybe they sing, I come from the land of Og, where beer does flow and we eat frog. Can't, can't much see because of fog. You better run, but watch the log. Yeah. But after the first battle, verses 1 to 3, which God graciously gives to his people after they seek his wisdom, we then fall into this familiar pattern and yet another grumbling, complaining, whinging story, but this time from a new generation. Now you'd think that after God has just given them a victory, that they would be full of gratitude and ready to move into this great time of praise and worship. But no, let's hear what happens next. Numbers chapter 21 verses 4 to 5. From Mount Hor they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. So Israel detours around Edom and along the Red Sea, all because of what's happened back in chapter 20, remember. So here's Israel moving closer to their God-given real estate, a land flowing with milk and honey and free from their enemies. But then they unfortunately slip into this all-too-familiar territory. They get stuck in grumble mode. 
It's the complaints department once more. Can you believe this Moses guy? He brings us out here in the desert to die. Why did our parents ever leave Egypt? Yeah, I'm sick of these water restrictions as well. I wouldn't mind getting a bucket of water and throwing it over Moses' tent. And what about the diet he's put us on? Moses' magical manna meals. I'm getting skinnier than my camel. I can't stand the food any longer. Manna bread, manna muffins, manna bars, manna mush, manna soup, manna shakes, sweet and sour manna, even manna meatloaf without the meat. Verse 4. The people became impatient on the way and they spoke against God and against Moses. Now, we can sort of understand and perhaps relate to what the Israelites go through, can't we? If we're honest, we can easily slip into grumble mode and we often forget to be thankful for God's many blessings to us. Instead, we so often opt for, well, the grass is greener on the other side and the good old days. I've seen it all too often in church life and I've been guilty myself of impatience and wrong thinking and ingratitude. And by now, across numbers, we've heard this complaints uh, number dialed up lots. Now, you'd think as a preacher, I'd enjoy some new material to work with. But no. Israel in grumble mode. Remember back in Numbers chapter 11. If only we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt at no cost. Also the cucumbers and melons and leeks and onions and garlic. But now we've lost our appetite. We've never seen anything but this manna. Remember back to Numbers 14. All Israel grumbled against Moses. If only we had died in Egypt or in this desert. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? Then Numbers 16 verse 13. Isn't it enough? They complained that you brought us up out of the land flowing with milk and honey to kill us in the desert. Can you believe they actually said that? (laughs) Numbers chapter 20, verses 4 and 5. Why did you bring the Lord's community into this desert that we and our livestock should die here? Why did you bring us out of Egypt to this terrible place? There's no water to drink. You see, despite a new generation of Israelites, they're just like their parents. Their bellies are their God, and they quickly forget the real God, their provider, their redeemer, their guide and deliverer. They quickly forgot that God has provided for them He has kept them safe. He has guided them to this point. But now Israel once more reveals her true nature. Their complaint focuses on their expectation that God is going to be like their divine waiter with a five-course meal that doesn't include garlic manna as an entree. Now there's no doubt that this 175-mile detour around the land of Edom is not a pleasant journey. It is inhospitable territory if Lawrence of Arabia is to be believed. About 3,300 years later, at the start of the 20th century, the British archaeologist and army officer T.E. Lawrence, we know him as Lawrence of Arabia, he made the same track uh, through this same wilderness wasteland, and this is what he writes. He says, This is a place of, of hopelessness and sadness deeper than all the open desert we had crossed. There was something sinister, something actively evil in this snake-devoted land, proliferant of salt water and barren palms and bushes which neither serve for grazing nor for firewood. Well, there's one major difference, of course, between Lawrence of Arabia and Moses of Sinai, and that is God has promised his presence, his patience and provision for his people. That's the five Ps. But still, verse 5. There is no food, there is no water, and we loathe this worthless food. How will God respond this time? Numbers chapter 21, verses 6 to 7. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. In previous complaints about food and water, God brings about their supply of needs, but not this time. God's judgment is both swift and severe. It's like God is saying, you're going to complain about things being bad? Well, let's make things a bit badder. You don't think things can get worse out here in the wilderness? Well, guess what? 
You see, God can use poor English because he's God and he invented languages anyway. So poisonous, fiery snakes arrive on the scene and when they bite the grumblers of Israel, it's a deadly bite. If you wanted to make a movie about this starring Samuel L. Jackson, you have to call it Snakes on the Plain of Moab. Not that I've ever seen the 2006 movie Snakes on a Plain, but I can sort of work out what the main plot is from the title, I think. Well, here we aren't told the number of people who got on the wrong side of these fiery snakes, but it does say that many Israelites died. So Judgment Day from the Lord God arrives in the camp. But then verse 7 is pivotal in the story. Verse 7 brings hope amidst, amidst the judgment of God. The people come to Moses and they say, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he would take the serpents from us. Take away the serpents from us. In one single verse, we're given this picture of repentance and intercession. The poisonous snakes drive the people of God to seek after God once more. They recognize their need for forgiveness. They acknowledge their sin. They realize that they've offended a holy God. And amidst their pain and suffering, they realize their ultimate dependence yet again is to turn to God. And so they go to Moses, their mediator, their go-between, the one appointed by God who can intercede on their behalf. And we read, so Moses prayed for the people. And we have here a great reversal from rebellion and judgment to obedience and mercy, from God showing his wrath and judgment, and upon his people's repentance, their pleading for mercy, we have God showing his grace. Well, let's read the extraordinary way that he does this. Numbers chapter 21, verses 8 to 9. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten when he sees it shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he will look at the bronze serpent and live. Now grace arrives in the most incredible way. It's God's idea that Moses should make a bronze snake and set it upon a pole. We don't know why God chooses to use a bronze snake. Perhaps because it was a symbol of their suffering. It might remind them of their sin sinfulness. Other people have suggested that bronze, or the reddish colour here, symbolises the colour of sacrifice or atonement, so reminding them that their sin deserves death in God's sight. We're not totally sure why God chooses this means of atonement for their sin, but we do know that it works. And God shows his mercy, and he provides an escape route for his people, a cure, an antidote is provided. And we see once more a nation under grace. The afflicted are restored. No doubt about it, this is a weird way to receive healing and restoration to life, don't you think? But because it's God's way, it's God's idea, it is to be trusted, and it works. By looking at this bronze snake upon a pole, no doubt lifted high enough so a crowd could see it, like a World Cup winning team lifting high a trophy for all to see, it's lifted high so the crowd could see it, and that those who were bitten could be healed and live. Notice the bronze snake doesn't prevent them from being bitten, but it does let them live if they obey God and trust what he commands. And the looking at the snake on the pole is not some quick glance or some accidental look. The Hebrew language shows us that the afflicted needed to fix their gaze upon this symbol. They needed to pay attention to this means of atonement. The bronze snake is not magical, of course, but by looking at it is an act of faith. So if you're a snake-bitten Israelite and you want to live, then there needs to be a defiant, deliberate act of your will. You, the dying Israelite, needs to look in faith in order to be healed. Michael Carr, the singer-songwriter, puts it brilliantly into song. Lift up the suffering symbol and place it high upon a pole. Tell the children to look up and be made whole. So Moses made a metal snake and nailed it to a pole, sent out the saving words so that they would know that the symbol of their suffering was now the focus of their faith, and with a faithful glance, the healing power would flow. Remarkably, incredibly, bizarrely, if I can say that with reverence, 
God provides here a symbol that brings forth his grace to sinful, rebellious Israelite, no, Israel. But you need to fix your eyes upon this symbol and look in faith and live. Well, perhaps we shouldn't be surprised. The longer you're a Christian and the longer you know the depths of depravity of your heart and mind, that tragically, we shouldn't be surprised, centuries later in 2 Kings 18, we learn that this bronze snake upon a pole has now become an idol. It's now a snare that God's people bow down and worship as a false god. Israel's sinfulness is so ingrained that they even stuff this one up. And it takes the godly king Hezekiah in 2 Kings 18 to smash this bronze snake idol to the ground. But how sad that years later, the good of Numbers 21 becomes the bad of idolatry. But then again, we're not really much different, are we? As we turn church buildings into idols, as we bow down and kiss altars and crosses and pretend to splash holy water around, how quickly can we take symbols of grace, good things that God gives us, and we quickly turn them into false idols? Well, were it not for the Lord Jesus speaking to the Pharisee Nicodemus in John chapter 3, you know what? We'd have no idea of, no hope of applying this bizarre episode as followers of Jesus. Some of you probably know John 3 verses 1 to 21. Have a read sometime if you don't. Jesus is speaking to Nicodemus who's been asking some pretty good questions. Jesus, what does it mean to be born again? And then seemingly out of nowhere, Jesus turns the conversation back to Numbers chapter 21, a story that Nico would have known really well. And so he says, John 3, verses 14 and 15, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. And then, of course, comes the famous John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Well, a few centuries after God shows his grace and mercy in Numbers 21, he does it again, this time to another generation of Israelites and to us. And once again, the symbol of mercy and grace is lifted up high upon a pole. Yet upon this pole was no bronze snake. Upon this pole was no lifeless imagery, no symbol of a creature. For upon this pole is a fellow Israelite. Upon this pole is the lifeblood of a person, a sinless person at that. Upon this pole is the Lord of all creation. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so Jesus is lifted up upon the pole, upon the cross. Four times across John's Gospel, this link is made back to Numbers chapter 21. In John 8, 28, John 12, verse 32, John 19, verse 37, where the reference to lift up high across John's Gospel always refers to Jesus upon the cross and our only hope. The bronze snake upon a pole brings healing and life to sinful Israel. Well, Jesus upon a pole, upon a cross, brings healing and life to sinful people now. The bronze snake upon a pole is lifted high enough for a crowd to see. Jesus is lifted upon a pole high enough for the world and every generation to witness. The bronze snake lifted up turns aside God's anger and wrath at sin. Jesus lifted up turns aside God's anger at your sin and mine. Bronze was the colour of atonement for ancient Israel. Red is our colour for atonement as the blood of Jesus flows for you and me. The bronze snake upon a pole is the substitute for sinful Israel. Well, the Lord Jesus upon a pole, upon the cross, is a substitute for sinful new Israel. Just as God provides an escape route for sinful Israel, so now he provides an escape route for you and me. And it is the same mechanism by which where to find healing and forgiveness and life. With eyes of faith, we pay attention to the atoning symbol of our only hope and our true life. 
given uh, human nature. I'm sure some ancient Israelites would have scoffed at the idea, would have made fun of the idea of simply looking to a bronze snake for forgiveness and life. Ha! Camels might fly. How can a silly snake on a pole heal my deadly snake bite? No way, I'll find the antidote myself, Moses. Look and live? No chance. I'm off to ER. You know, we've made some good progress in anti-venom. The many today scoff at the idea. They, they make fun of simply looking in faith at the Lord Jesus crucified yet risen for forgiveness and life. No chance. God helps those who help themselves, you know. Look and live? No need for that. I'm a Catholic. I'm a Baptist. I've been baptized. I'm a Pentecostal. I speak in tongues. Just look to Jesus to be right with God? No thanks. I'm a pretty good person myself. Jesus dying for me? Maybe. I'll look into that one day. But I'm right at the moment. But the message of grace in the wilderness wanderings and now could be no clearer. Daddy, Daddy, my leg hurts, my leg burns. I think a snake bit me. Look, my son, look. Look to Moses and the bronze snake lifted up. Look, my son, look in faith and live. Pastor, pastor, my soul hurts. I've sinned yet again. Look, my brother, look, my sister. Look to the cross of Jesus lifted up. Look in faith. Look by hope and live. Numbers chapter 21 and John chapter 3 invite us to trust God and to do what he says, to take him at his word, to look in faith and believe, and then to pass from judgment to salvation, to pass from death to life, and to find the removal of the sting of sin, which ironically came from another snake bite, in Genesis chapter 3, which has bitten us all. Look in faith, look in faith, again and again and again to the cross of Christ lifted high. Look and live. Thanks for listening to the Hills for Maturity. Keep growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ.